You're you in 30 years. Whoa. Some advice. Open a Laurel Road checking account when you refinance your student loans. You could get a rate as low as 1.37% variable APR, plus a cash bonus. I can do that. Also, don't date Parker. Oh, the defense attorney? Trust me. Save yourself with Laurel Road. Visit laurelroad.com slash save yourself for more information. Rates depend on your credit profile and include discounts. Terms and conditions apply. Laurel Road is a brand of KeyBank, member FDIC. The Black Doctors Podcast highlights the stories of minority professionals with the goal of inspiring others. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and share with others, because the next generation can't be what they don't see. Tune in every Monday to hear our stories told by us. Hello and welcome back to the Black Doctors Podcast. I'm Steven, your host. This week, I'm so excited to be speaking with Dr. Mana Hagos. She is a graduate of UCLA and USC, where she attended medical school. And she's currently an anesthesiologist. We're here to talk about her practice and some of the resources she has developed to help other people that are interested in practicing medicine. Dr. Mana, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start at the very beginning. It's usually you know, a good place to start. When did you decide that you wanted to go into medicine? About the third or fourth grade, my elementary school had science discovery days. And I'm very fortunate because they had great speakers, live presentations that were available. Prior to this, I always knew I had an interest in the natural sciences. So I was interested in geology, oceanography. At one point, I was interested in astronomy. But it was about the third or fourth grade when I saw my first human brain. It was a uh, elderly man who had had to Alzheimer's. And seeing that brain and learning a little bit about medicine from the presenter let me know that I didn't need to go dig in some rock or go, you know, into the ocean or look up into the stars to find something interesting to study and wonder at. You and I walking around was, to me, like the eighth wonder of the world. And that was, you said, the third or fourth grade? Mm Mm-hmm. And you got to high school. What did you do? Um, did you stick with that goal? or? So I stuck with that goal. It was my experiences as a first generation immigrant gave me insight into the health inequities that exist for so many people. So my initial interest, you know, childlike interest, this is so cool. This is amazing. There's so much going on, became more informed and mature because I started noticing, you know what? health outcomes really differ depending on someone's ethnicity, socioeconomic status, what resources they have available, etc. So my interest in medicine was actually maintained and informed by those experiences. Wow, that's so interesting. You had the insight uh, and the foresight at that very young age. What else did you see or can you elaborate on that? The things that you saw that really um, inspired you to, to, to challenge some of these inequities? Absolutely. So I am the eldest of five. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm a first generation immigrant, proud Eritrean American. And like many immigrants, oftentimes the eldest children, because of the opportunity that they have with education and having a good grasp of English, are enlisted to help the parents with documents, with speaking to, you know, other people, various professions to access care, resources, etc., So I saw that pretty early on because I had that, you know, those mature responsibilities essentially of, you know, translate this paperwork, (laughs) make sure you get it right. It's it's, it's important. (laughs) Um, You know, this, this notice came, this, um, this flyer says this, like, what does this really mean? Is this worth, is this worth our time to invest in, learn about, et cetera. So through those types of experiences where essentially I at times acted as a translator, et cetera, I started to notice, okay, you know, how will you speak English really affects the care that you have because mm-hmm. if people don't understand you, they can't communicate with you and or they have their own biases. Oh, this person doesn't speak English. They probably aren't educated, et cetera, et cetera. And for people who aren't immigrants, They don't realize, well, this person doesn't speak English. This is like their fifth, sixth, seventh language, which was the case of my parents. So seeing how 
people's biases or their own personal experiences reflected onto those situations, let me know that, you know, I could really bring this insight as a physician caring for patients, realizing there's so much more than what you see. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, those experiences you had clearly um, had an incredible impact on the direction that your life took and, and still continues to evolve. So, Dr. Hagos, you went to UCLA for undergrad. Tell us about your experience there. It was intense. <laughs> <laughs> I, ca- I came from a wonderful, high-performing high school, very blessed that you know my mother had the foresight to move us from a uh, school district that historically was poor, had poor performance to a higher performing school district. So I had access to incredible teachers who were really passionate about the subjects that they taught. So I had really a lot of opportunity to do well. And I also had the interest because I knew I'm going to be a doctor. I have to do well to get it, you know, to set myself up for every step of the road, which is the long road to becoming a physician. So my high school experience was had set me up to that point. But then when I got to UCLA, I got this sense of overwhelm because now I'm in a much, much larger arena. My first few GE classes, general education classes, were three to 500 students. Wow. And before I had no problem asking questions. And now I thought, oh my gosh, everyone's going to think I'm an idiot. <laughs> They're going to think she hasn't read the material. What kind of a question is she asking? So I didn't feel comfortable to, you know, really be as much of a go-getter, I guess, as I was prior because I was uncomfortable in such a large environment. But I eventually got over that because I realized, hey, this is affecting my performance. I can't have that. (laughs) And uh, I had a, a revelation of sorts where I realized that my performance isn't something that should be controlled or impacted by other people Mm -hmm. because I knew what my purpose and my why was. And in order to actualize my goals, my dreams, I needed to put the blinders on and go for it. So I went from sitting in the back of the classroom to sitting in the very front. That way I could, you know, essentially tell myself, I don't even know who's behind me. I ask a question. It doesn't matter. It's me and the professor and whoever's in the seat next to me. And, um, you know, took ownership, essentially, of of my journey by realizing that it's not about what other people think, what they think you should say or do, how you should do things. It's who you are and how you best learn. So taking that ownership allowed me to do very well academically, such that I was able to attain the dean's list every quarter until I graduated and graduated with a 3.95, which is associated with summa cum laude but i'm not sure why i didn't like sign up and get that (laughs) accolade or whatever it is but you know that understanding my why taking ownership and responsibility for my life really allowed me to just go for it i love that i love that uh response especially in in being a first generation immigrant i mean the things that you're able to accomplish through hard work and and like you mentioned putting yourself in the front of the classroom and, and believing you're the only person there. I, I love that that concept. <laughs> I wonder, though, being in such a large institution, how did you and what kind of support did you have when you started applying for medical school? Yeah, that's a great question. I was fortunate to gain acceptance to summer enrichment programs that were mm-hmm. targeted toward underrepresented minorities in medicine. And some of those programs were at UCLA, PrEP being one of them. So it was in those types of experiences that I got to collaborate and meet other people who look like me who are at an advanced level. So one of those people who is now a dear friend of mine, completing, working on her urology uh, residency in Northern California, was one of my most amazing resources because I would say, hey, do you mind if you look at my personal statement for the 20th time? (laughs) Because I'm just not sure about this sentence. So it was those types of relationships that I gained from those. Anika, she's from Guyana. So it was those types of experiences that allowed me to build relationships with people who knew better than me 
because if it's one thing that I knew, it was that I didn't know a lot. (laughs) So I needed to connect with people who knew better. So those programs gave me a lot of amazing resources to apply to medical school. And a lot of it was just me surfing online, finding as much information as I could. The FAP was an incredible resource, a fee assistance program available to um, aspiring physicians who are applying to medical school. The AMSAR is another one, essentially a, a book at that time. I think it's available electronically now where it's essentially a handbook of all medical schools in the U.S. And I remember that book. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you remember just flipping through it like, okay, yep. what state, you know, has what medical school, what are the, what are their mission statements and what are the numbers? So those are the resources that I really leaned on heavily when I was applying. Yeah, I think I remember when I was applying, there was like a random Excel spreadsheet that somebody had made. It was floating around the internet. I think I got it off like Student Doctor Network. And you could plug yeah. in your data. Did you did you come across that one? No, but I did scour SDN like all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the healthiest yeah, habit no. to have. But, you know, when we are in need of information and we're just so hungry to get as much as possible, we will sometimes, at least I know I did, overdo it by stocking these forums and trying to find out as much as possible. But that Excel sheet sounds like a wonderful resource. And it sounds like your experience led you to create a wonderful resource, the Pre-Med Survival Guide, how to get your mindset right, which we'll get to in just a bit. Um, but Dr. Hagos, as you matriculate through medical school, you know, what support system or network did you end up developing to help get you through? Well, like I said, it's all about network because those networks provide incredible resources. And as a first generation physician, got to connect with people who know better than you who are already doing it. And one of those incredible organizations that I connected with early was ABWP. And it's the Association of Black Women Physicians. It's an incredible local organization with physicians from various specialties. And they had a mentorship program, sister to sister mentorship program, where they connected physicians to medical students. They try to do it according to the specialty interests you had at the time. I had incredible mentors through that organization. I had an, a mentor who was an anesthesiologist, another one who was an ear, nose, and throat specialist. And it was those relationships amongst, amongst others that really helped to provide me a, a wonderful support network as I went through the rigors and gauntlet <laughs> of medical school. <laughs> it is a... Gauntlet. And as a fellow anesthesiologist, we obviously have to chat a little bit about that. We, we talked earlier about how versatile the career field is and, and how versatile we are. But what led you to pursue anesthesiology as a medical specialty? I love that question because I actually came into medical school thinking I was going to be a nephrologist. Wow. And that was because I had an interest in chronic health. And I thought, OK, diabetes, hypertension, nephrology, this would be an appropriate uh, connection. Um, but after speaking to a few nephrologists and then rotating through internal medicine other and other specialties, I realized that that wasn't the right fit. Um, they are incredibly smart physicians, like so many physicians are, um, but it didn't suit me very well. And I realized that I liked to think about things, but I also like to use my hands. And Anesthesia was just such a great fit because it's pretty procedure heavy. You're placing lines, you're placing blocks, you know, you're doing intubations, all of that stuff. But it's also very cerebral. People will look at an anesthesiologist in the operating room after, you know, induction intubation and see somebody sitting down or standing up doing something. And they may think, oh, it's it's a very relaxed uh, specialty in medicine. You're not doing much. (laughs) But actually, it's quite cerebral. There's there's always something going on in your mind. You're always monitoring. You're very vigilant. You're aware of what the surgeon is doing because that in, impacts your anesthetic, you know, from the duration of surgery, the type of surgery, what is the patient's underlying health conditions, et cetera. So there is so much more to it beyond just what you see somebody doing with their body. There is so much going on within the mind. And I thought that was very attractive because 
I like to use my hands, but I also like to sit down. I also <laughs> like to think. <laughs> That's how I knew surgery wasn't for me was because the the sheer physicality of it. I realized this, you know, this is better suited for somebody else. I like something. I would like a specialty that allowed me to have a mixture. And not only in terms of what you do, but also in the various settings that you can practice in. And within the specialty itself, you have so many options to, you know, potentially go into entrepreneurship, you know, work part time, moonlight, do all these things while pursuing your other passions outside of medicine. I know you mentioned this previously, that anesthesiology is a career, but your passion was in music or is in music. And I absolutely agree with you that your career choice is definitely something that you want to have interest in because you have to dedicate so much time to it. But may, being able to maintain your passions and picking a career that gives you that type of flexibility is paramount. And that leads right into the next question for you. You finish residency and you're kind of faced with this dilemma or, or choice in following the standard career or following that passion. You mentioned you had passions for entrepreneurship, for humanitarianism, for health equity, and you chose to take kind of a leap of faith, if you will, and go a completely different direction. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So while I was in residency, there was very little time to pursue my other passions, but I knew that I had to prioritize what I found important, like we all do in life. And one of those things was business. So I was a voracious reader. I still am, you know, got my Kindle subscription, read a couple books a month. (laughs) A couple couple books a month? Yeah, I was very serious. Yeah, audio books or you actually read these books? uh, I read it. Electronic e-books on my phone. I don't read. Um, You you can't tell. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you've got music and ethics and all this other stuff. So, you know, to each their own. You know, I was very interested in business. I knew I didn't know much about it and finance. So the majority of the books that I consumed, though I should have done audiobooks, now that I think about it, because I could have saved my eyes (laughs) from (laughs) looking at my phone all day and night, were related to investing. So Vogel or Vogel Vanguard, uh, founder had a book, um, The White Coat Investor, you know, Mm -hmm. all these things that we've heard about and more, made sure to make the time to read them. And I also wrote um, as a form of cathartic release, work for cathartic release. I have written poetry since I was a kid and I expanded into nonfiction. And that's when I started realizing I was getting in my own way. And I thought, oh, my gosh, if I tell people that I do this stuff, they're going to say you should stay in your lane and, you know, The point of residency is just to study medicine. There's nothing else that you should really be doing. And I thought, you know what? I have to do what I know that I want to do. (laughs) So when I have the time, I make the time and I would write. And uh, one of the ideas that I had to write was the pre-med survival guide, how to get your mindset right. As I was concluding my, my training, I realized there's so much that I didn't know when I entered medicine. Uh, both in medical school and residency. And if I had known those things so much earlier in college and high school, even it would have really helped to make the path smoother and healthier, in my opinion, because then I wouldn't have been as stressed (laughs) going through the process. And although mentors and sponsors are incredible resources for aspiring physicians, they are not with you at every second of the day. Yeah, They have their own life. They have their own schedule. And when they can provide you those nuggets of wisdom, you savor them because, you know, they mean everything at that time. But in addition to that, you need other resources. And that's where the pre-med survival guide began. And I think it's key because there's a ton of survival guides, especially social media is just blown up um, with everybody being a pre-med coach, even people that didn't go to medical school, uh, go figure. But <laughs> how important is it that you have created a resource based upon your own experiences as an Eritrean American woman, um, first generation physician, mm-hmm. and you've bottled all that up for people that 
identify with any of those categories and they can go through and learn from the lessons that, that you have shared. Absolutely. You know, we've heard this statement, you can't be what you can't see so often. And in medicine, it's true even more so. Depending on your geographic placement, there just may not be anyone who looks like you who's in the field that you want to enter. So having a resource that's digital allows you to get that access to see that at least once. And um, the practical advice and strategies that I put in there are so relatable that I've had people who are not physicians or aspiring physicians, people who are nurses, lawyers, engineers say, these lessons, these tips are life lessons. It applies to all of us, especially the mental health component that you bring up because a lot of these careers that we pursue are so demanding. And if you are the first, insert blank, to right. do that, <laughs> it's a lot. It can be very overwhelming. And being able to navigate that with a resource that you can find in your phone, I think is just going to be such a tremendous resource for so many. And it has been. Hundreds of people have loved it. And I'm so fortunate and grateful uh, for that and for that to expand. When you wrote this and put this together, was there some fear that nobody would want to use it and, and no, nobody wanted it? Actually, no. Oh, <laughs> Not man. at all. No. Because I know so many people who were like me, underrepresented minorities in medicine. And we've all said to each other, man, I had no idea it was going to be like this. Or they told us it was going to be hard, but I didn't know it was going to be this hard. Or, you know, I studied all these hours and I barely passed my exam. What is that about? These kinds of issues that we face are things that we don't really hear about prior to entering medicine. Yeah. You know, you hear you got to rock the MCAT as best as you can, do those clinical experiences, make sure you get X amount, 100 hours of volunteering experience, get that research in too, <laughs> if you can publish, even great. It's just like, it seems like a never ending list of things that you need to do. But how do you actually do those things? Yeah. How do you find the mentor? How do you conduct yourself so that you are demonstrating your commitment, your dedication, your compassion, etc., to strangers who have thousands of other applicants that they are considering. So those are the types of lessons and experiences and examples that I put into the pre-med survival guide. And I was confident that people were going to enjoy it because there isn't anything else like it out there. There's great resources that talk about strategy, gap years, summer enrichment programs, MCAT strategy, CARS, all of this stuff. But something that says, hey, when you have somebody who tells you, yeah, I don't really know if you could do this. Mm. Or, yeah, I don't know if uh, this is the right pathway for you. Well, how do you actually deal with that type of negativity? Or even more common, when you have that self-doubt. Oh my gosh, I spent all this time and all this effort and I'm doing all this stuff and I'm not where I want to be. I bombed my MCAT or, you know, my science GPA is low and now I have to take gap year or do a post back and I have no idea how to navigate this pathway. How do you deal with your own self-doubt when you're telling yourself, yeah, I don't know if you can do this. It's, it's a completely different challenge when you have, are faced with external negativity and also internal negativity. So I address both issues because those are issues that I dealt with throughout my medical education and training. So I, yeah, I had every confidence that <laughs> there were people who were going to resonate with the challenges and the message. Yeah, it sounds like this is a book that I needed uh, many, many years ago, maybe on audiobook though, not not having to read it. You know what? There's an audio book. All right. There's audio. So, so tell us where, where can we get this resource? What is the format and who would you say it's for? Well, there, the resource, the pre-med survival guide can be found at drmana.com. That's D O C T O R M A N A dot com. And there is an ebook for all those who like to read digital, of course, 
There is an audio book for all those who can't stand reading on a device or, you know, on a hardback. So exactly. So that's the podcast. <laughs> and um, there's also a digital interactive workbook for all of us who kind of like to be a little bit more active in our learning, like to use our hands or just like to interact with the material. There's an interactive workbook that goes over the lessons and materials that were presented in the ebook. So I always say the best combination, in my opinion, is both the ebook or audiobook, depending on what you prefer, and the interactive workbook, so you get the comprehensive experience. Fantastic. And of course, we'll include links to that in the show notes, the show notes that nobody ever actually looks at, but I spend a lot of time writing every week. Uh, <laughs> They're good. I've seen them. Oh, you read? <laughs> okay, you're the one, one person's read them, but you like to read. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so Dr. Mana, one of the things that we were kind of discussing before we, we jumped on and started recording, I thought was so incredible that you put into words, but the hidden curriculum of higher education, can you explain what that is and how that applies? Absolutely. And I'm glad that you brought that up. <clears throat> so we all know generally what the curriculum is, right? You get the syllabus at the beginning of the quarter and semester, and it says, these are the books. These are your resources. Read these, read these chapters, and this is your testing schedule. So that is the curriculum, essentially, for whatever class it is, whether it's physics, mathematics, biology, etc. But the hidden curriculum is what is not printed on that paper or what your professor doesn't say to you, which is the how and the why and the who involved in being able to navigate that paper format of the curriculum well. Mm -hmm. So what does that really mean? All right. Your professor says, you know, your grades are going to depend on this percentage, your midterm, your final. Cover this material. You're going to do well in the class, depending on the difficulty of the class. Well, if you are a first-generation aspiring physician, you may look at the syllabus and think, okay, so all I have to do is just read this chapter and then the questions are going to match exactly what I read or exactly what you uh, mentioned in your verbal presentation, your PowerPoint presentation, and I should do well on the exam. I've got an A and I should be good to go, right? Not necessarily. <laughs> Many times, students, including myself, will come to an exam and say, I do not remember seeing this in mm -hmm. the in the class presentation or in the book. This is not how I was shown the material. This is not how it was presented to me. And because I had limited myself to thinking that one presentation is the only presentation that would impact my performance on an exam. So the hidden curriculum goes into understanding, essentially, in my opinion, the mind of the test creator. What is it that they want you to know? Do they just want you to know that the mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell? No. <laughs> It's a nice statement that we all remember because we've heard it so many times, but it's okay. Well, what's the significance of the electron transport chain? What is the significance of ATP production? How does this relate to the organ on an even macro level? How does this affect the person? Now, if you bring it clinically, okay, well, what does that mean when we have an ICU patient and we're repleting electrolytes? So if you see a little bit of what I'm going into, the difference between the written material, what's in the book, and the application, yeah. it can be a very vast distance. So the hidden curriculum is essentially the step stones that get you from the material presented to the performance or the application of the material. And I think this goes hand in hand with a wealth of resources that are oftentimes shared. I had uh, Dr. Lolo, he's a dentist, a Haitian American dentist, and he shared about that, how there's a the hidden curriculum. There's the test that the old exams that are handed down and passed around the old notes and how if you're not part of select groups, then perhaps you don't have access. And, you know, whether it's right or wrong to have old exams, a lot of times they're, they're released. But then you get to see the format of the test questions and, and that kind of where they they're going with the, the exam. Absolutely. I actually got a chance to listen to. That, that sounded great when he was talking about, well, I'm not a part of these specific groups. And if I'm not a part of that group, it seems like I'm locked out of that resource. 
and absolutely agree with what you're bringing up and what he brought up that that is a part of it. Hidden curriculum sometimes is as simple as realistic or hand tactile resources that are hidden from you. That's definitely one way that they manifest. Another way is sometimes they're behind closed doors. For example, who is the maker of the test? Usually the professor in association with their graduate TAs, the teacher teaching assistants. Well, if they're the ones who make the test, wouldn't it make sense to talk to them and figure out where their head is at when they're, you know, writing these questions? So that is one of the lessons that I realized the hidden curriculum is going directly to the source and talking to them and not asking them, well, what's going to be on the test? Because no one's going to do that. (laughs) But being able to communicate, this is who I am. This is what my interests in. And I am committed to doing well in this way. I read, therefore, I've read the material. This is what I understand. Is that how I should be understanding it? Okay. I did this question. I got the question right or wrong. And I think it's because of this deficiency. Is there anything else that I'm missing? (laughs) Is there another way I can think about it? So asking these types of probing questions, I found was one of the useful strategies to do well. And again, one of the hidden the hidden points of the curriculum. Because the professor didn't come out and say, everybody should come to my office hours X amount of times a week before the exam to do well. They would say, here are my office hours. Yeah. End of sentence. (laughs) (laughs) So those are some of the points. I think it's fantastic and and useful information for folks that are in the process now. Um, So Dr. Mana, thank you so much for coming on the show. Now I know in addition to the other stuff you're doing you do have a social media following you are posting useful tidbits of information some tiktok videos maybe talk about uh or tell us where we can find more from you okay so you can find me on instagram my handle is motivation md underscore 101 so again that's motivation md underscore 101 And that page is all about essentially all things pre-med motivation, lots of videos, some of them dancing videos, (laughs) and a lot of helpful information for pre-meds who are navigating this path for the first time. Awesome. And be sure to check out the show notes, the link to the pre-med survival guide, how to get your mindset right. Dr. Hagos, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast, for sharing your incredible story and the resources you've created. Uh, looking forward to seeing where you go next in life and uh, we'll definitely stay tuned because representation matters. Absolutely. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. The Black Doctors Podcast is a nonprofit volunteer passion project with the goal of inspiring all who listen. Tune in next week for another episode of the Black Doctors Podcast with Dr. Stephen Bradley, your friendly